Hi everybody, welcome to Smart Money with Emmy Hernandez. I'm your host, Emmy Hernandez. No matter your age, it's never too late or too early to start thinking about making your money work for you. But where to start? That's why I'm here. I'm excited to lay out some key steps to help you save, grow, and invest your money in the smartest way possible. We are living longer today, so we're going to talk about long-term care insurance. Who is this for? Why do we need it? With a special guest, Paul Kraus. There was an article in Wall Street Journal recently about long-term care insurance. Say that it isn't dead, but it become an estate planning too. So today we're going to talk about that a little bit because we are living longer and perhaps maybe we're going to end up in a long-term care facility. We don't know. So I have a special guest with me today, Paul Cross. Paul ran facility, a nursing home facility and um, several facility in the area. And he's going to help us digest into um, all this technicality and what's going on with the industry. Hi, Paul. Hello. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. So um, you were running a nursing home facility? Yes. Uh, how many do you run in the area? So we have three assisted living facilities in Upland. Okay, perfect. So, um, like I said, you know, in the recent newspaper, they talk about long-term care, that people are getting mm -hmm. older, and when they get to older and they have to go back and um, go into a nursing home facility, mm -hmm. there's a lot of expenses there. Very much, yes. Yeah, can you explain a little bit about, you know, like in your facility, how do people usually come to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have, um, we're considered board and care homes. So what they are basically, um, we kind of different than a, a large facility where we have more hands-on help and more more long-term care, I should say. Um, our, most of our patients are, um, they have severe Alzheimer's, dementia, um, hospice, or just mild retirement as well. Um, but I see a big difference um, compared to us from a large facility where it, when it does turn into long-term care facilities. Okay. Yeah. Is there a particular age group that you see? Uh, yeah, I'd say average, I'd probably Average of 85 and higher, 85, 85 years. And higher, yes. that's come to your facility. Yeah. So that's kind of like a later state, correct? Correct, yeah. Okay, um, and <laughs> might be a funny question to ask, but do you also have like more male or female? All female. There you go. 95% of my industry is all female. Right, see that's, that's, that's one thing I keep telling my client, mm -hmm. you know, women live longer and we may have to plan. You sure do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so when the male patient come into your facility, they're pretty popular then, huh? I have three right now, three males, and that's a lot actually, to be honest. Oh, wow, yeah. okay, okay. Um, what about the, um, the type of payment? Mm -hmm. Or um, did they get any you, they get any help from um, Medicare? Does Medicare taking any any care of, of this? So currently, right now, um, our industry we're not allowed to accept insurance yet. So all the benefits and everything go directly to the family, mm -hmm. um, to the des to the designated point of uh, power of attorney, and so all the funds go directly to the family, and then the families pay us privately at that point. Okay, but when you say that you're not allowed to accept insurance, it doesn't mean that they shouldn't have the long-term care insurance, though, right? Because totally agree. Yeah, yeah. long-term care insurance I see is a huge weight off people's shoulders when they come. Um, a lot of families that come to me, they're looking at how mom and dad can afford to stay at a mm -hmm. facility for a few years. Okay. And um, I notice when people have long-term care insurance, it is a huge weight off their shoulders. Okay, yeah. so basically when you said that you not accept intermittent, meaning that the family actually is the one that dealing with the, the Correct. insurance and then just, you know, pay you. Yeah, we'll fill out the forms. The families will provide me forms to fill out on their behalf. Okay. And I submit those back to the family or directly to the insurance companies. But Great. yeah, we're not allowed to bill insurance yet ourselves. It's coming up soon. Mm -hmm. um, I hope it is. Okay. And they've been working on it for about 10 years now. So yeah. it, it's coming close. So. Okay. I'm looking forward to that. We're coming back and talk about that a little bit, but what I, I would like to know now, because there's confusion with my client, mm -hmm. when I talk about long-term care insurance, they always tell me, well, you know, Medicare is going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. But from what I know, that if you being hospitalized for, let's say, three days, mm -hmm. and then the doctor said you have to go to rehab, mm -hmm. that's when Medicare actually paid Correct. after that, but it's a certain period of time, right? How long does it an average of 100 days a year. 100 days. Yeah. And the first 20 days is usually 100 percent that they pay for. Yeah, I've heard different conflicting stories on that. Where um, 20 days is usually covered 100 mm -hmm. percent, but what I've heard is that it's more the condition you're there for. Okay. I and mean, I believe it's for more people that are elderly. 
that might say have a broken hip. Mm -hmm. And if they go to rehab, they know they're not gonna get a full recovery. So they don't need to spend three or four weeks in a skilled nursing facility for rehab, but a shorter stay. Okay, yeah. okay. So, but for people that need to stay longer than that, mm -hmm. then after 20 days, they need, they have some type of copay. Correct. Right, so mm -hmm. family have to pay for some Medicaid pay, pay for that. Correct. Up to 100 days. Mm -hmm. After 100 days, if they still stay in your facility, then they'll be on their own. So what happens a lot with me is I see a lot of families that go, they, they use up their 100 days pretty fast throughout the years going back and forth to the hospitals, back and forth to rehabs. Okay. And so the problem I see a lot happen, um, right now I'm currently dealing with it, with her family, um, she needs to be in there about another 10 days, and she's already exhausted her 100 days. So right now they're paying about $400 a day to just be in the facility without getting too much care. And um, not my facility, the skilled nursing facility, the rehab. And they're paying about $400 a day um, for those 10 days before they can actually come back to their home, to my home, where they live. Okay, and some people also said that, well, you know, if I don't have um, the, the resource to pay for that afterwards, then uh, Medicare or the government will pick up. But I think mm. that's kind of like to be your last resource, right? You don't ever want that to be your last resource. Okay. You really don't. I mean, and to be honest, it's not the facilities that I would never, I would never want to send anybody I love to a Medi-Cal facility. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean it more there's not that many of them. Uh -huh. So it's really hard to find those facilities. I mean, like very hard. I've had people looking for months to find an open facility with an open bed. And when they're there, they literally are gone within two hours to reserve that bed because there's just a shortage of beds. Oh, really? Yeah. So is that that's true that if you run a facility mm -hmm. and if you, like you in, in your case, your your facility is a private pay. Mm -hmm. If you have one bed that take Medi-Cal patient, mm -hmm. do you now have to open up to more? Is there a regulation for that? Well, it's called a, the ALW, the Assisted Living Waiver Program. Uh -huh. And right now, there's about this many homes that are allowed to have them. But there's a new bill on the ballot right now that's going to open them up a lot more in California. So it just, I believe it just passed, like recently, within a couple weeks, that the bill just passed, and they're going to open up more. Um, it's more like a, a, a testing period right now. They're trying to see how many they can actually open up and how many people are on board with actually running the program correctly. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. What are the qualifications in order to be in that part of, of uh, you, know, you open up that type of home? For me to open that? Um, well, for one, if I can get on the program, I do that. And to be honest, with California, it's just a lot of paperwork. So doing a lot of paperwork, getting certified that I can actually be on the program. At that point, I can start accepting people on the waiver program. And then you're going to have, now you build the government directly then with that. Yeah, yes, no. So it, it's really up in the air right now. So up in the air enough to where, put it this way, I've had, there's about 30 of my friends that do this for a living. And I have one friend that has, she's on that program, one. And she was on it for, I, I want to say about eight months. And recently, within the last two months, she dropped off the program because it was such a fiasco hmm. for her getting paid in time. Um, so it's just not quite there yet. It, I, I, what I hear is about two more years until it's actually in the mainstream. Um, but I believe what they look at more is the operators of these board and care homes, which are more long-term care facilities. Um, they're not quite sure how to bill insurance quite yet. So they're trying to make the program more easy for everybody to get onto it uh -huh. so it runs smooth. Okay, so that's a lot of red tape still right now. That's you don't all know it what's is. going on. So that's why the main reason you said you should be prepared. You really don't want to have your parents or anyone right. that have to go into that situation situation correct go for that type of facility correct yes okay that's that's very important mm -hmm. so um we're just gonna have to come back and talk a little bit more about how your uh your own facility runs sure. so we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit I am a Los Angeles designer. It's a cotton, an Italian men's shirting. The Littles. And then these things sort of jump out at you. Put us to work. Show us, right, show us how to go. make something. Watch CCN Sunrise on Step 1 TV. Moving yourself or someone else from the home into assisted living facility can be confusing. And also there might be a lot of misconception about that. Thankfully, today I have Paul still here with me to help us out on this. Okay, so Paul, um, can you help me um, clarify a little bit about assisted living facility? There's mm -hmm. many types of that or it's just one? No, there's definitely many types. So assisted living is more like the umbrella term for either 
people consider more like a large facility, like a 100, 150 bed facility, like the big, big ones you see out there. Uh -huh. And then we have the smaller ones that are like more, we call them a six bed facility. And the six bed facility is more a residential home that is um, licensed from the state. And you have six people living in each home and we have three caregivers or two caregivers on staff 24 seven all the time. Um, the larger ones are more, they're based on um, mild retirement, more like, hey, dinner's at five o'clock, come on down. Um, we have bingo at three o'clock and so forth. Um, our kind of homes, the assist living homes we have are more geared around more hands-on help, a lot more help towards mom and dad. Um, a lot of the misconception I see with people is they, they look at assisted living and it, 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 they're not quite sure where mom should, or dad should go when they actually leave their home they've been in for 30 or 40 years. Um, it really depends on the level they're at currently at that moment. Um, they are stepping stones. It's not like you go to one place and that's it for the most part. Uh -huh. A lot of facilities will say that they're like that, but the reality is um, they're not really like that. They're, so you would say like if they're still more active, mm -hmm. need like you know more like like socialized activities, so that would probably be the bigger one that Correct. have the games or functions yep. available for them. Correct. Yes. Okay. So if um, in such a situation where someone come to you and say, "Hey, you know, I'm thinking about bringing my mom mm -hmm. here," how do you help them? I mean, do you help them do some evaluations? I do. You're looking at their medical record, or what do you what do you do? So I, I like to sit down, and talk to families, and really give them an honest opinion on what I think. Is best for mom or dad so okay. I'm here for them only for mom and dad okay. so if somebody comes to me I'm not a sales guy I'll talk to them about what I think is best for their mom and dad if mom and dad are both together still and they want to just have some retirement I kind of suggest a larger facility in the area and then um, later on when they need more hands-on help they can transition over into one of our facilities at that point okay yeah is that because of like at the larger facility you can have a bigger unit that they can stay together yeah they have like a, a little a small apartments I mean uh -huh. we have like private bedrooms we have couples that share bedrooms and so forth but yeah it's more like when they're more mobile they don't need as much um, people watching over them as much um, more hands-on help if um, medication management and so forth um, you all the large facilities still do that for sure but their core model I'd say is really um, more alert and active people. Mm -hmm. um, the large facilities do have like the memory care um, parts of their units that people go there, but um, most of my clientele, they come to me when mom and dad are either transitioning into the memory care facilities uh -huh. um, or they, they're at that point where they're about to go there. Uh -huh. um, and mostly, to be honest, it's just a numbers game. Um, the larger facilities more have like a 12 to one ratio with staff to residents, or have a three to one ratio. Oh, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. So you, um, because it's more like, let's say, you know, cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to watch them. That's why you have a lower. Correct. Okay. Yeah. How, how do you um, talk about, talk a little bit about how you staff people? Mm -hmm. What are the qualifications? How, how do they come to, to yeah. you? Yeah. So all this is the living were considered non-medical facilities, which is great. So that means I take all directions and orders from physicians, from physical therapists, from nurses and that. So when people come into my home, they, may, they say they might have a, a private room they live in. So if I want to make med changes or anything, I'm always in constant communication with the doctors and the nurses to get directions from them. We're not the ones that make the decisions on what's best for mom and dad, but we are more based on they live at our facility with help all the time. So my caregivers are all, um, a lot of people I know, they don't hire like nurses and so forth, like in the board and care homes, just in the fact that um, they want to get more direction based on the doctor's advice and nurse's advice from their primary care physician or whoever's managing their care at that point. Um, Majority of the staff in the board and care industry are live-in caregivers. That means they actually live on site. So if you're working, you say a five-day shift, you actually live on site 24 hours a day for five days. You're living on site. Yeah. What kind of training do they go through? I mean, they, they are not um, registered nurse, but they have to go through a specific type of training. Right. right. So right now there's a 40-hour requirement for the caregivers to um, before they start working on the job. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. And you said that they, they take specific direction from mm -hmm. the primary doctor they do yeah. oh. everything we do is so if I have to if a, a resident's behavior is acting erratic for a few days different mm -hmm. um, I get in touch with the physician talk to them about the changes I've witnessed and we try to make either medication changes or if it's physical changes and so forth so we get all directions from um, professionals do they have to be a situation where you have to transport them to that doctor also yeah. or you call the family member pretty much both so uh, if somebody's going to go to the doctor the families always are aware of they're going to the doctor okay. usually the family will take them we have van services that will take them to the doctors but we also have um, everybody that comes to us um, I have a medical director at my place um, anybody when you're at my homes a lot of times you'll have people that can't leave it's too hard for them to leave to go out to the doctor it's a lot of work for them to go okay. so all of our services you can bring everything to our facility so doctors physicians 
um, physical therapists, hairstylists, uh-huh. um, beauticians. I mean, everything. We have all the services you can imagine that will come to the facility. And another important point probably be who are the one that make this type of um, authorization, right? Mm-hmm. So family members should probably have the power of attorney. 100%, okay? yeah, they yeah. should. Because most of your patients might not be able to even communicate, you know, directly. And I, I always tell people to start that process early because um, power of attorney is not always a quick process. Uh-huh. And sometimes, most of the time, people need to be a quick process. Right. And it's not a quick process. Right, right. Yeah. And the power of attorney, I always tell my client too, you know, you get it way before you get sick. You do. Because, you know, <laughs> a lot of time as an attorney, um, I can't have somebody sign if they don't have the ability to That's sign hard. anymore. Yeah. Especially financial too. Right. So right. then that way, you know, they would have to go to court to get like a conservative ship. Mm-hmm. Do you, you have people that do that All the time. Too? Yeah, that's more that's more difficult, right? Because every time that you want to change something, mm-hmm. you have to go back to court again. Correct. I and it's hard when you have a memory and memory impairment like that. Um, it's very hard to get that person to sign and uh-huh. actually have the attorneys get the whole paperwork done. Wow. Um, I totally agree with you. You get it done before, and most time family members have their son or daughter take care of it. Mm-hmm. So the trust is like irre- irrelevant at that point. Right. Uh, so I always say get it done early, so when the time comes up, it's already completed and it's an easy transition to move mom or dad out to uh-huh. where they have to go to. Uh-huh. Do you normally take the um, statutory form? You know, the healthcare directive. Do you do you take that? Also? I take everything. So when people move in, I ask them for a copy of everything. Uh-huh. So if anybody comes over and needs a copy, I have it. I know who to give it to and not to give it to, of course. But yes, it's much easier when I have copies of everything. Great, great. Yeah, yeah that's also one thing that, you know, I always tell my client, you mm. want to have this piece of document you available do. and do it now right. when you still have the ability to do so. Yep. Okay. One other thing that I want to know is if you can tell me a little bit about, how about the cost? Mm-hmm. How much does this usually run? Yeah, so it really fluctuates in the industry a lot. So mm-hmm. um, normally, like the larger assisted living facilities, the big ones, they might have like an admission fee. Um, and then they usually have like their, their room rent fee. Like if you have a small little apartment, say, you have the apartment fee or the room rent fee. Then from there, they kind of do their evaluation and they find out what level of care you need at that point. And then usually there's like three or four different levels of care. And um, you might start off at level one and then eventually you're gonna go to level two, level three, and level four and so forth. So um, the pricing model, I could say with all honesty is kind of like, um, it's very discouraging to be, to be honest, especially with the large ones. I know a lot of my friends that have the large ones are gonna hear this and not be happy with it, but um, everybody that comes to my facilities usually leaves a large facility because their price doubled in one month. It went up three or four thousand dollars in one month because mom, um, mom might have been diagnosed with dementia yeah. and um, they can't afford now eight or nine thousand dollars a month anymore. Uh-huh. Well, that's 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 quite, um, you know, true because Average cost in California can, you know, from the number the government put out, it's like uh, seven or eight thousand dollars. Correct. A month yeah. For a nursing home, mm-hmm. so that's that's really get into a lot of, you know, your asset and you have collected it does. out quite a bit. So we're gonna come back and talk a little bit about how we can use some insurance to help with mm-hmm. this. Great. It's time for a taste of sunrise. Wow. The chef's impeccable. The food, amazing. The show, delicious. But you guys put the T-E-A in teamwork. Taste of Sunrise on Step 1 TV. Last segment, we heard Paul say that Cost of living in the facility can be thousands of dollars. That's a lot of money. So I still have him back here with me, Paul Cross of Gracious Living. Hey, Paul. So um, be a little bit more detail with mm-hmm. me. Okay, when you said that in your facility can cost, you know, five, six thousand mm-hmm. dollars a month, can you identify like what condition and how much it costs? You know. Sure. Yeah. So um, pretty much the whole industry does work, like I said before, is on the the level of care pricing. So you have the room rent, and then you have the level of care pricing on top of that. Usually it determines at the evaluation stage, at the very beginning, mm-hmm. what the cost's gonna be. Um, I kind of went around that knowing I've been in family's positions before with my grandma and so forth by putting my grandma in assisted living for dementia. Um, I hated the idea that every month it was a different cost, and you never knew what it was gonna be. So my facility, we offer flat rate pricing. So we do like a flat, flat rate for everything that needs to be done with you. But um, I'd say the average cost um, is right around like say four to five thousand dollars a month mm-hmm. per person with level care on top of that. But 
the large facilities, everybody comes to my facilities for um, they need more hands-on help. When you have a smaller facility, you have the staff ratio, like I said before, three to one compared to 12 to one. The large assisted living facilities, I've had many, many, many people come in and tell me they've been quoted 10, 11, 12, $13,000 yeah. um, per month for one person, so not what for do, two. What, what do you get, like, you know, for ten, twelve thousand $12,000, is that for the level where they cognitively, cognitively impaired that they need help with everything? Oh yeah, that's Already usually that's for usually that. for very advanced dementia and Alzheimer's uh -huh. where um, all your faculties are pretty much like um, you need assistance for everything. Okay. Yeah. So if they just if they still can function, maybe need need help just kind of supervising and transferring from you know from bed to whatever, mm -hmm. but not like twenty four seven watch. They basically pay the the room rent. Well, it's kind of both to be honest. So the problem we have right now is that if you're diagnosed with dementia, just uh -huh. diagnosed from your doctor, you have to go to the memory care unit of that facility, of the large facility. Okay. That's where usually everybody the price doubles. So you might be at three or four thousand dollars right now because you're active and you're fine. You can walk down for breakfast, but as soon as you have the diagnosis of dementia, uh -huh. you go into the memory care unit. There you go. That's usually when people come back to me and say, "Wow, I got quoted. It went from four thousand a month now to seventy-five or eight thousand dollars a month." Right. So they usually come to me and they say, "Okay, your rates are usually thousands cheaper for a smaller environment, and you have a lot more hands-on." But you more, it's more than that. You have like my caregivers. We have the same caregivers all the time. So I have three caregivers per home. Mm -hmm at Gracious Living. And um, it's the same familiar face. So you have the same continuity of care, um, the same person taking care of you every day over and over and over. Um, the large facilities, they have those um, set up in place, but it's not really their model. So usually when they have advanced dementia, Alzheimer's, um, the majority of the places, not all of them, it's usually um, a board and care is a better environment for hands-on watching mom and dad. Good, good. Well, this is actually kind of like good lead in because you talk a lot about, you know, the memory care mm -hmm. unit. Um, when I talk to my client about start using long-term care insurance mm -hmm. as part of the planning into this, right. okay, uh, when you purchase the long-term care insurance, we all, the first question we always ask, okay, different policy, mm -hmm. you know, different benefit, but what would be the trigger conditions, you know, for the, the long-term care to start paying? Most of them either going to have to, like, if you unable to perform this mm -hmm. call, unable to perform two out of six or two out of seven mm -hmm. ADLs or right. um, activity of daily Living. livings, yep. right? Good, yeah. So can you can you <laughs> identify those six sure. or seven for me? What are they? Well, there's not really, it's, it's more a generalized, now a lot of people use software for evaluations. Uh -huh. So it's more generalized. It's really taking the physical and the mental state of your loved one and kind of looking at it overall what they really need, not just usually the five or six things like you talked about anymore. It's now more what the quality of life overall is gonna be for everything. Okay. So we kind of stepped back a few years back and said, what's gonna give mom or dad the best quality of life? And that we provide that kind of service based on that. Uh -huh. um, it's not like in a born and care environment, it's not like if you pay 3,500 a month compared to 45, you're getting less quality of care. It's not really that. Um, I know there are definitely some facilities that are a lot cheaper, uh -huh. um, but they're skimping on something. Okay. Uh, but for quality of life, it's usually like we're looking at an overall picture of your overall health for memory. But the biggest thing for sure when you're in a large facility is once you get diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia, uh -huh. that's the big game changer right there for sure. Right. That's what I know because um, with insurance company, because I help some of the client doing some claim, mm -hmm. you know, for that filing claim, they know that, okay, the trigger point to pay the benefit right. is those, you know, unable to perform certain things, mm -hmm. but the memory care, it's a big thing. Oh, yeah. Once you, uh, even if you can still function, mm -hmm. walking around, whatever, but once you have the uh, dementia, mm -hmm. that triggered the policy right, right away. Right but then that. after that, we have to look at the waiting period mm -hmm. because insurance company usually don't pay right away. Right. They either gonna have 30 days, 60 day, or mm -hmm. 90 day waiting period. Yep, right? I see that a lot too. Yeah, so a lot of time people will try to tie that in with you know 100 day Medicare pay. Right, yeah. they, they have like a 90 they try day to. waiting period right. and try to work right. that out. Some do work out, mm -hmm. some don't. Um, now, another thing though, to be careful with using long-term care insurance, also the way they filing claim, mm -hmm. right? Like you said, your facility don't build insurance directly. Correct. But you would provide, you would help the patient mm -hmm. um, to records 
oh, all of course. the records what the medical need they have, right? Cor- so oh, the correct. family member can get all the record from you mm-hmm. and they can process that they do. insurance. Yeah, you, yeah, usually the insurance companies will provide a form to me or the family directly. Uh-huh. And it's usually a, either a one or three page form. Okay. And we go through and we check off, like you said, the, the activities per day. We Yes, they can do that. No, they can't do that. Yes, they can. Uh, and then we kind of certify that, yes, this is accurate. This is what they need done per day. Okay. Yeah. So that's a very important thing important thing also that you need to connect with the facility that are certified licensed properly because mm-hmm. insurance company would look at that right so if you don't you're not a qualified facility they're not gonna approve oh, yeah. the claim so yeah. it's important because sometimes people like feel like well i'm just gonna have you know my mom stay at home still but hire somebody out from the street yeah. to that doesn't last too get, long that doesn't, that <laughs> right. doesn't work right no okay. it, it works it works for a very short band-aid fix i call it uh-huh yeah okay. One other thing, though, um, this might be something because I, I know you talk to your um, patient all the time mm-hmm. or family member. A lot of time, long term care in a traditional way, mm-hmm. they almost like car insurance. Mm-hmm. If you don't crash, you don't right. get paid. Yeah. Uh, but these days, there's some also other hybrid type of long term care. Mm-hmm. If you want to kind of like let them know, also we call asset based long term right. care, oh. right? Mm-hmm. So basically, it's a hybrid. It tied in the life insurance policy mm-hmm. with the long term care be- right. benefits. Mm-hmm. So if um, your patient or your your parent who own the policy have to go into facility and they qualify, the insurance will start paying mm-hmm. for these. But if they never use it. They will, um, as a beneficiary, like the children, right. will end up get the debt benefit out of it. Mm-hmm. So it's either or. So many people now, though, I found out that uh, a lot more people have been asking about that mm-hmm. because it's kind of like an estate estate planning tool right. as yeah. well. Mm-hmm. So it's not like, oh, if I don't use long term care, I'm gonna lose all my money. Yeah, no. Yeah, and some policy even have a uh, money back guarantee. Right. So basically, if you pay in premium or whatever, how much, and you never use it. And you like, yeah, I'm still think I'm healthy. Mm-hmm. I want to cancel it. Right. They can at least get the principal. In principal back. Well. Correct. Yes. So you heard about that mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, you know, uh, we kind of like wrapping up here. Do you have anything else that you want to kind of like, you know, um, as an education for people to know about? So what I see, the long term care insurance is a, a, it's a blessing. It really is. When I have families that come to me and they're, especially when they're in frantic mode, mm-hmm. not sure what to do, especially when you, what you mentioned is uh, moms living at home. We have a private caregiver coming in. Yeah. That seems fine until you need somebody 24 right, seven. Right. So when you have the long-term care insurance, it is a blessing to have that where you're not scrambling around trying to sell mom and dad's house to make the money off it. Um, and then at that point, if they, if they seem like everybody has reverse mortgages, you know, and so they're trying to sell this, they have like two months to sell up and then the market's not selling houses right now. So having a long-term care insurance, I see like a very great peace of mind when families come in, they don't have to worry about that. They're only worried about finding the best place for mom and dad. There you go, a yeah. peace of mind. Peace of and mind. And make sure that your 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 loved one will be always be taken care That's of. That's all you're worried about is the, your loved one. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Sure. That's it for today's episode of Smart Money with Emmy Hernandez. As a financial advisor, I'm here to help you so if you have any questions or comments, send it to me by email to emmy at ehfinancial.com. Don't forget, if you miss any part of the show, you can watch us again on ehfinancial.com or crowncitynetwork.com. Remember, being smart with your money is easy, and you can do it. Thanks for watching. See you next time right here on Smart Money with Emmy Hernandez.